So next up, we have Bill Smart, who's going to share with us his experiences in teaching robotics with Ross. I'm, I'm Mac Newby. Um, so Ben told us how to measure great code and bad code. Let's talk about how to generate bad code. And that's mostly <laughs> undergraduates. Um, so just to be clear, I'm going to use the word students a lot during this talk. Um, when I say students, I mean undergraduate students or master's students or PhD students in my class. I don't mean my graduate students who are actually awesome. Um, so um, after a couple of days of really good technical talks, um, I want to sort of help close out the conference a little bit with just some rambling anecdotes about teaching with Ross. Um, I've been teaching with Ross for a few years now, and we've made some observations in the classes we've done. Um, the first is, why, why should we care? about teaching with Ross. Um, and it's kind of a hard sell. Um, the, the reason I'm going to give you is that eventually um, there are companies who are going to want to hire Ross programmers. And those programmers are not going to be self-taught, probably. They're going to be taught Ross in a university environment, a college environment, or online. And so we really need to think, if we want to get Ross into the commercial world with people who know how to use it, we have to start teaching people how to do it. And so this is actually from the Washington University graduation last year. Um, our fine, fine students uh, who got their jobs. Yeah, well. um, so why teach Ross? We should all know Ross. That's, that's a given, but why teach at Ross? So a show of hands. Who knows Ross? All right. Hands high. Hi, 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 hi. Who learned Ross in a class? Uh, Look around you. That's one of my students. Um, so the thing I've come to realize is that you guys are awesome. Okay, You're at the very end of some bell-shaped curve of awesomeness. Um, you learned Ross from the wiki, which is awesome. You learned it from your colleagues. You learned it by asking questions. You learned it by going out and grabbing that knowledge and ripping it out of the, the web and stuffing it in your head. Most students are not at the skinny end of the curve. Okay? And so when we, when we teach students, we have to teach students who are here. Right? Um, we, want to ed we want to think about how to get Ross into people's heads without them having to be awesome first. Okay? So to give you some context, um, I'm currently, for the next two weeks, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, it's a pretty good university as far as US universities go. Uh, we're ranked number 14th in the country right now. So the context is not that we're at some place where the students are stupid. Right? Our students are very good, are very talented, and very applied. Um, it's not at this Washington, and it's not at this Washington. It's unfortunately at the Washington uh, in St. Louis, which is <laughs> right in the middle. Um, I'm moving to Oregon in two weeks. Yay! Yay! All right. I'm happy if you're not. Um, <laughs> I've taught two, I, te I teach two classes there, um, mobile robots and advanced mobile robots. Um, the mobile robots class is an intro class. It's, it's like a number of other such classes. I've taught it about 10 times over the years. Um, I've taught the advanced class uh, about five times over the years. Um, I tried to count up, the number, count up the number of students, probably about 400 over 12 years. And so the class has evolved. Um, Mostly computer science, but especially in the early years, we got uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, physicists, psychologists, um, some business majors sometimes. Um, when we started teaching it 12 years ago, we used the handy board. It's a fantastic 6811-based microprocessor. Anyone use that? Oh, the gray beards. And a whole pile of Lego. You build a robot, you stick a handy board on top of it, and it runs around. Very simple sensors, bump sensors, IR proximity sensors. Um, then we graduated to Vidir Design's erratic robot. Um, I think it's called erratic for a reason. And player and stage initially for a, uh, for a year or two. Um, and that worked out really well. Um, the, the nice thing about the erratics are, are that they're proper robots. They're not Lego robots. Player and stage gave us a lot of uh, ability to do more advanced work and to do it in simulation first. And then eventually we eased into Box Turtle in the early days of Box Turtle. Anyone use Box Turtle? All right, the, the gray beards, right? Uh, I have something to say about Box Turtle in a little bit. <laughs> um, and more recently, in the past couple of years, we've moved on to TurtleBots. Um, 
and Diamondback. Not electric because we, we chose a stable release when, when we started uh, developing the course. Um, and this semester, um, I let some of the students in the advanced class work with electric, but work on my PR2, um, which is sort of a brave decision if you see what my ro students do to my robots. Um, I've got something to say about that too. The, the story behind all of this is that going through the years from through those different iterations of robots and controllers, um, they get more capable. Okay? The Turtlebot is a fantastic platform, when you especially when you compare it to a 6811 processor on a bunch of Lego. The sensors are much better. It can do much, much more things. But it's also a lot more complex. Okay? Programming the 6811 was a single thread of simplified C doing a closed loop. ROS is ROS, right? There's a lot of it, and it's, a, it's much more complex. So you, there's a trade-off here. And part of the trade-off is we shift in focus. So now ROS is complex enough that it scares away the philosophy majors. Okay? Because you actually have to know a bit about computer science to use ROS effectively. Even if you don't need to know that much, the perception is that you really do need to know a lot. So here's my syllabus. Anyone who's ever taken a robot class will have taken this syllabus. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you'll notice that it's full of stuff. It's about 15 weeks, I think. Uh, it's up to 15 weeks. And we cover uh, you know, most of the, the, the basic stuff. Um, the labs from this last iteration were like this. Uh, lab zero were the awesome Ross tutorials from the wiki, which is awesome. Melanie? Melanie's left the building. Oh, I'll, the, the wiki is awesome. Um, the first half is in simulation. The shaded half is actually on the turtle bot. Um, you'll notice the first lab is really straightforward. In stage, get a robot to drive forward and stop 50 centimeters away from something. OK. So how did it go? It was awesome. The students love robots. Simulated robots, real robots, white robots, green robots, they love them all. Um, I love turtle bots. They're so much better than Lego robots, and I, I, I don't have the words to express how much better that they are than the erratics. Um, the sensors are better, they're cheaper, they're more disposable. Um, they're, just, they're just better on every, every, every account. You all should buy 10. Um, the labs are more sophisticated. With the Lego robots, we could do obstacle avoidance by bumping into stuff repeatedly. Brittenberg vehicles, bumping in. And that was fine. Now, when I tell the kids about Monte Carlo localization, they can do Monte Carlo localization in the labs. And that's really good, because before, the labs had a bit of a disconnect. We'd be talking about all these modern techniques, and they would be doing obstacle avoidance by bumping around and stuff. So that's really good. Um, so we win. And we fail, too. Um, the students are. My students are really good, and it's going to sound like I'm being critical of my students for the rest of the talk. And I suppose I am. But they, computer science students are used to programming computers. They're not used to the real world. So we get them in their simulator to drive a robot forward to 50 centimeters towards an object. And so they're used to efficiency. So if you're used to efficiency, what do you do? You drive the fo robot forward at 10 meters a second and then you stop it when it's exactly 50 centimeters away from an object. Anyone uncomfortable with that? <laughs> yeah. So they do that. They bring it to the real world. They put it on the turtles. And I crash, they crash into the wall repeatedly. Because the turtle bots have physics, right? They're, they're subject to inertia and all that other stuff. Um, so they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how to debug that especially. It's a, a different kind of debugging. It's not code debugging. The code is correct but there's a behavioral debugging, and they have a lot of problems with that. Um, my students, although they are often seniors and grad students, are unaware that spewing all of the output from a Kinect sensor across a wireless network when 10 of your friends are doing the same thing <laughs> slows it down. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, is anyone familiar with the phrase cargo cult programming? So uh, uh, you, you, can, you can look up the, the story behind it. But basically, what that means is if you don't know how to write some code, you go to the web, and you pluck a piece of code that someone says does the right thing, and you stick it on your robot and run. 
You don't understand how it works. It's, it's kind of like TF to me. <laughs> um, you stick on the robot and it kind of works and it kind of does a demo, but when it fails, you have no insight as to why it fails. Um, I find my students doing that more and more because a lot of code on the web, there's a lot of ROS code on the web, and they don't understand the code so well that they can write it themselves. So uh, we'll call that a fail. Debugging tools, they don't know how to use RViz. They don't, they're not used to using GDB even, um, debuggers even. So using the, the suite of tools that come with ROS is, is really hard for them, just conceptually. Um, I got it wrong. Um, all of my labs are already implemented somewhere in ROS. Uh, that's, that's, that's tricky. Um, <laughs> Box Turtle changed its API once every five seconds. Um, it's, it's hard, right, because students would ask, well, how do you do this? And I say, well, the API is this. And before I'd finished the sentence, they'd changed it. That led to some consternation. Um, my word your assignments, um, one of my labs used to be implement localization, Monte Carlo localization. And it was worth quite a lot of points, 20% lab grade or something. The last time I ran it, and I said, use ROS, use as much of ROS as you can. <laughs> See where this is going, right? One student handed in a single launch file. <laughs> and there was no way that I could not give them full points. <laughs> right, um, it's hard, man. Um, Linux is hard. Students don't know Linux. If you don't know Linux, you're kind of screwed. Uh, they don't know Bash. They don't know what an environment variable is. And they can learn all this stuff. But you've got to put it into that 15-week block, and something has to come out. Um, they run some crazy version of Linux in my teaching labs, and I'm not allowed to suggest they do otherwise. We spent three weeks building ROS for that. I have no control over their graphics cards. Um, I have to get the central networking guys at the university to punch holes in a firewall for me. That's a weak response time. And it seems to reset itself every three days. Um, and my students are just unused to plugging things in. Turtle bots at the end of the day, plug them in. It doesn't seem like it would be hard. Um, they love robots, but they don't understand it. Um, my, my wife teaches computer graphics, and one of my advisees was taking her class, and they said, I asked them, how did it go? And he said, well, you know, I, I really love computer graphics. I thought I would really enjoy the class, but you know, it's just hard math and programming. And people have that with robots, too. It's like, these things are awesome. You see the videos. You see the, the blog videos. Um, underneath that, it's just solving equations and writing code. Okay? And that realization is not one that most undergraduates have when they watch the quadrotor videos from UPenn. <laughs> um, they know math. We make our students take math. But getting them to use it is kind of hard. That's not specific to Ross, obviously. But, um, uh, it's hard to debug robots. So um, the turtle bot's running towards the wall. They have, a, they have a second problem with the turtle bots, even if they do it slowly. Um, the range, the, the, the smallest range on the connect is about 50 centimeters. And so if you don't stop a little bit early, you get closer than 50 centimeters, and the connect returns, anyone know? 11 meters. So if you just miss hitting the wall, you then accelerate like mad to, <laughs> into it. Because we've talked about proportional control. Um, but they came to me and said, oh, the turtle bot's broken. OK? Because they didn't know the failure modes. Um, and this is sort of related to the, f the first one. You see all these awesome videos of Ross and robots. Um, and it's actually quite a hard thing to realize, for the students to realize that they won't be those awesome videos out of this class. You know, they'll do some interesting stuff, but they're not going to be featured on, on the wiki, on the blog. Um, so practically, what can we do? Um, if you're going to do a class, think about the infrastructure in advance. Talk to your administrators. Um, that takes months to do. Um, don't let them install on their own laptops. I had a student miss the first two lab assignments and get an F in the class because he was trying to install uh, ROS onto his Mac. So there's two problems with that. One, <laughs> that it took him that long. And two, that he didn't do the assignments on the lab machines. Um, make sure you know what's there. I have a hard time tracking all the packages. Like, don't give him the assignment if there's a package for it. Um, 
Students don't know subversion, um, source code control, but you can integrate that kind of stuff into the class and stuff, ease them into it. I use subversion as my hand-in mechanism. Right? I will check out your code and I will run it, and if it doesn't make, I give you zero points. Most people use Python, so that's not an issue. Um, <laughs> manage your expectations. You're not going to be the blog video tomorrow with your lab assignment, but you know, you could do some pretty cool stuff. Um, everyone wants to use the robot on the day the lab is due. Google Calendar is an awesome thing. Um, and videos, the robots always break. We know that, right? But all the robots always break on the day of the demo. And so encourage students to take videos and then use those videos for, in place of a demo. None of this is rocket science. Um, final thoughts. ROS is awesome. And I think it's great for teaching because it's modular. You can give them the whole system, have them replace bits. Really, really good. Um, but you've got to think about it before you deploy it. I didn't think about it really hard the first year I did it, and it didn't go as well. Um, you need to know, you, the student, needs to know a lot more stuff. Ideally, you should have two or a two or three class sequence that starts off with learning Linux and then learning all this other stuff. But that's hard to do in a university environment. Um, and finally, students aren't like us, right? Most of the people in this room are intellectually curious about ROS. We go there and we, we're, we're keen to learn it. A lot of students are keen to get an A. And those things, are, those things are different, and you need to take that into account. And finally, um, moving your robotics class to ROS is hard. It's a lot of work. And things will go better and faster if we share the load. It's the traditional crowdsourcing call. Um, there's a SIG that we started today um, for ROS and education. And that's construed very broadly. Um, if you're interested, it's on the wiki. The wiki is awesome. Go and sign up for it. Uh, there'll be a mailing list out soon. And with that, I'll take questions. Uh, so the question was, how, how often do students continue with Ross after the class? Um, if they take the follow-on class, 100%. Um, if they work in the lab, <clears throat> 100%. Other than that, it's close to zero, I think. Um, I think most of the, <coughs> excuse me, most of the, the robotics activity at WashU is in my lab. And so basically, if you stay in the lab or stay in the class, you use it. If not, you don't. Um, but a, num a number of people have gone on to other places and used Ross. A number of students have gone on to Willow, say, and, and have joined the team there. That's interesting. Um, the PR2 is scary. Um, so of the students who could use the PR2, of all the students in the class, about 30% of them chose to actually use the PR2, which seems strange to me because this is a unique opportunity. Some of them chose to use a turtle bot instead because it was less scary. Like the, it was less just, I, I, I don't even know on what axis it's scary. Um, most of the students chose to do stuff in simulation and then hand it off to someone who would then use it on the robot. Um, having said that, the, one of the teams that did use it managed to replicate some work we did a few years ago with a robot photographer, uh, which took us three-person years, maybe. Uh, they replicated it as a class project with two of them uh, this semester. Uh, and that's mostly because of Ross and TF and all the, all the plumbing is already there. One more question? Uh, my graduate student? Um, they, they, they pretty much like it. It fell into um, two... Oh, so the question was, what, what were the students' opinions of Ross? Um, it fell into two modes. Some thought it was really, really awesome because there was a, you know, a lot of stuff. They could put stuff together quickly. Uh, the other mode was, there's a lot of stuff, and it terrifies me, and I've never dealt with something this big and an integration problem like this before. Thank you, Bill.